Quigley in five, underwater in the yellow lane. Jess Carling of Great Britain. Quigley goes through, the silver to Jess Carling, wonderful silver medal for Great Britain. Welcome to the Honest Athletes podcast with Lauren Quigley and Jazz Carlin. Hello everyone and welcome back to episode five of season two of the podcast. As you will have seen by the title of this episode, yes, this is a guest episode and yes, this one is very close to home for me, which I'm obviously super excited about. The guest joining us today swam at the 1984 LA Olympic Games, competing in three events, those being the 200 breast, 200 medley and 400 medley, where she made the Olympic final. She also competed for England twice at the Commonwealth Games in multiple events, one of those jazz being the 800 free. Aside from these incredible achievements, this woman has been one of the biggest inspirations through my own career and is often one of the answers to who was your biggest inspiration. She really is a huge reason as to why I'm so passionate about the sport of swimming, which is why I'm incredibly proud to introduce my auntie, Gaynor Willis. So Gaynor, thank you for coming on. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Thank Good. So I know that I spoke to Jazz about having you on and we were both super excited, but the first, obviously we would like to start at the start. So how did you get into swimming? Why did you get into swimming? All that good stuff. Um, got into swimming because of my, uh, both sw- both sisters were swimming and just wanted to be like them. Didn't really think about it other than, you know, if those two are doing it, I want to do it. Um, and really made quick progress. Yeah, it's. I think that's the thing with, with sport. A lot of it is from the family, those foundations, I guess, from those early years. And as you said, did you say you've got sisters? Obviously, we know Lauren's mum as a yeah. sister. Have you got another sister too? Yeah, we've got another sister, an older sister. Um, both sisters actually swam internationally uh, for Great Britain. Both swam at the uh, European Junior Championships. Um, and yeah, very successful as uh, youth youth swimmers. And how was it growing up? Was it quite competitive between you all? I guess when you were all representing GB strong swimmers, were you quite competitive between you all? No, I don't think so. I mean, Yvonne did backstroke like Lauren. Um, Karen was a breaststroker and I began on breaststroke and then switched to IM, but by the time I'd sort of established, was establishing myself on the international scene, um, my eldest sister retired. So obviously I know all these things, guys, but it's always nice to hear. Did Nan and Grandad, did they encourage you to continue to swim? Were they clued up on swimming or was it more of like, well, she's enjoying it, let's figure it out as we go? No, I don't think they were clued up at all on swimming. Uh, and the thing, we our swimming career sort of overtook everything. So um, I moved away from home when I didn't make the 1980 Olympic Games um, for Moscow. Um, my dad said, do you want to, do you want to move to Wigan Wasps who had the best ladies team uh, at the time, coached by Keith Bewley. And um, I said, yes, without a second thought. So I'd only just turned 14 then. And I was the kind that I actually didn't like family watching me. So as soon as I went to Wigan, although mum and dad obviously picked me up every weekend, um, I rather they didn't come to watch me race. <laughs> it's actually mad, even knowing Keith and um, what a wonderful man and coach he was. And such a small swimming world it is such a great community of athletes, coaches that all share, I guess, that same passion. But bringing it, I guess, to today, there seems to be kind of programs that you can then start to get selected for to um a smart track or um be put on these programs in england wales and scotland that kind of help you progress give you a bit of support um give you access to competitions how did it work back then um was it just were you identified as a strong swimmer or was it just um you had to kind of forge your own path in that way um i think 
at the, at the time, there was uh, literally Wigan, Leeds, Coventry, and Crystal Palace. Those were the only 50 meter pools. Oh, and Blackpool, Derby Baths, which was my favorite pool ever. It was, I had uh, salt water. So you were dead boy and, and it was always a fast pool. Um, so you, you knew the people in your area and the, North, the Northern counties always were quite strong. And Keith, my coach at the time was a lady, uh, Lily Pantling, who was way beyond her years in terms of swimming and training methods and everything like that. She actually couldn't swim herself, but she just nurtured great youth swimmers. Um, and she used to arrange for us to go over to train sometimes um, at the Wigan pool because it was a 50 meter, well, it actually was 55 yards, but um, a 50 meter pool to, you know how different it is, you know, swimming in a 50 meter than a 25 mind blowing. So we used to go along on the, on a Sunday and Keith was just a great coach and he knew all the great swimmers that were coming up. And because I think um, Lily was, you know, he was fond of Lily Pantling, he, um, he gave me my first ever costume, actually. My first ever costume that came outside of the family, if you like. And he said to me, if you win every event in your age, um, I'll get you, I'll give you a costume. Well, I knew I couldn't win the backstroke because my best mate, Andrea Horsfield, always won that. So uh, I said, well, I can't win the backstroke, but I'll, you know, I'll give it a go for all the other ones. Anyway, I did do, and he he was true to his word and gave me a speedo cosy. So that was it. I was I was up and running. So we always sort of had this connection. Um, so when dad said, did I want to go and swim with Keith? It was a no-brainer because he'd produced Anne and Janet Oscarby, June Croft, Steve Poulter. You know, he, he, he was just a successful coach. I love that you just touched on getting your Speedo suit and stuff like that. And I'm sure we will comment on the difference nowadays from what a Speedo suit back then was like to now. A big difference, of course. Um, whenever we joke with mum and you, you know, we always joke about a woolly swimming costume and stuff like that. It's always funny to listen to. So, um, but yeah, we'll definitely touch on that later. But I know that when you were, you were amazing young as you were older, but you really were phenomenal young. And that's something that a lot of people struggle to deal with. If, if they do really well when they're a youngster, it's unusual for them to still be up there when they get older. Mm. What, I know you were, were you fastest in the world at 14, 15 and in, in 13, sorry. And yeah. in your age, obviously at, at breaststroke, I want to say. Um, yeah. How, how was that for you? Because that brings a lot of pressure. And as a 13 year old, when people start getting excited, how did you find that time and deal with it? Well, it actually didn't Lauren, because I mean, yes, there was, there were world rankings, but there wasn't, there wasn't the computer. It wasn't a computer age. So you waited every month for the world rankings to come out. And actually the juniors weren't, included in that anyway I mean it was just a it was just a thing that yes you might creep onto the world rankings list now of course everything's instant so you would be picked up on and there would be pressures but at that time there was there was none or at least I I never I never felt any pressure but I think it, when you're young you just approach every race I mean I, I, I felt I could beat everybody you know, and I was very confident in those days. Taking it back, obviously, I feel now, obviously, I don't want to make you feel like older and we're talking back years and years. <laughs> obviously, even I've like been retired a couple of years now, oh, a few years now. Um, but 
I think one thing is obviously about the information that we have with training now. Everything seems to go down to, it's very personalised, um, a lot of sports science information with your training. You can find out so many different things. There's more information on sleep, recovery, um, warm-ups, all those kinds of different bits. Um, what did your training week look like? I've heard some horrible things from Lauren's mum about some of the training sessions she used to do. So what did you kind of training week look like and what support did you have outside of the pool to to focus on with your training too well i think from um with with lily pantling obviously we weren't on an enormous yardage then we had um a coach come in from canada peter abink and we were just doing crazy yardage then and on top of that Sometimes my sisters and I cycled to morning training, which was, I don't know how many miles, Lauren, quite a few miles, wasn't it? There and back. Um, there was weights. He had us climbing ropes in the middle of the pool. Um, 10,000 backstroke with 10, 200 butterfly with T-shirts on. I mean, it, it was absolutely bonkers really um and i think that yardage obviously kept me in good stead because when i did go to keith the the, the training program there was very different it was more quality over quantity and i think even more so now yardage you know isn't as evident obviously you did a ton of uh, of mileage didn't you for your event yeah yeah, I did do quite a bit of um, some bigger training. On average, I guess that's 75 kilometres a week. But being, I guess, distant swimmer, um, I felt like that was quite key to my training, doing consistency, but also probably for the mental side of it to give me confidence. Um, but even from like the psychology to the sports science to the nutritionist, there's so many other things that we get access to to support that 75 kilometers a week. Whereas I guess you doing like really big yardage, did you get access to the physios and the nutritional support to help you re recover, fuel for training, all those kinds of bits? Or were you kind of left to just these big, huge sessions? <laughs> I'm just going to quickly interject and say, I've actually heard they, were, they didn't even have drinks bottles on poolside. So I, I have no idea how they did the yardage on no drink whatsoever or anything like that. Yeah, um, we never had drinks. I mean, you know, there, there wasn't a bottle on, on poolside. And sometimes we were training up to three hours if it was uh, like a Christmas special, you know, a, a, a training camp where you might do three hours straight off. Um, but... 75,000 for your yardage, ours was probably that as well, I would have thought, when I was early teens. Um, no, yeah, there was no, no access to physio. I was quite fortunate that um, I got a sponsorship of 500 pounds when, when I was um, about 12. Yeah, from a local, um, pharmaceutical company and you know that 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 was an enormous amount of money at that at that time and then there was the sports aid foundation but that was it i mean you know you you had to be excellent to get a sports aid foundation grant a full one i never got a full one i i just got a part one so your nutrition was just what you you know, found out yourself and your physio was what you paid for yourself. I mean, when we were, when the three of us were at home with mum and dad, you know, it was, it was in the days of the infrared lamp and dad used to say, oh, you know, if you've got an injury, he'd massage. But, you know, we actually didn't know whether he was doing more harm than good because he was dead heavy handed anyway. And, um, but, you know, you'd come away thinking, right, well, you know, I can't feel that uh, sort of sh shoulder ache anymore because Dad sorted it out, you know, but... Gay, the costumes. <laughs> we'll touch on that. Um, the difference between costumes then and costumes now. And would you have liked to have the racing suits we've got or we, we have at the minute back then? Or were you quite happy in your nice woolly costumes? 
Well, I think when I swam, obviously we had 100% nylon suits, so there was no giving them. Um, so unless it was a speedo, chances are it went right up your bum. It was awful fitting suits, unless there was speedo. Um, and then if you were if you were quite a good swimmer, you might have for a final a lycra suit, you know, the uh, 80-20. Um, and they were obviously cut away, cross back or keyhole or whatever. There was lots of different backs. But Keith, Keith gave me my first, not my first um, lycra suit, my third lycra suit. My first lycra suit came as a Christmas present. Myself and my mate Andrea decided we'd get a maroon swimsuit and it was a racer back and it was in Lycra and that was going to be worn for Manchester and District finals only, not heats. Um, so that was treasured possession. And then um, my eldest sister's boyfriend came back from Canada with a... Uh, a, a, a lycra suit with a Canadian maple leaf going up and down it, very old design. But again, that was another race suit. And then Keith gave me that. So I was well away then, three race suits. But I, I don't, I have obviously tried on um, knee suits. I mean, when they went full length, oh my gosh, no, I couldn't have, I couldn't have done that. And even now with the leg suits, not for me. Not getting these thighs in there. No chance. Be awful. What a sight. So no, I'm glad we raced in what we raced in. So obviously there's massive differences. And from just growing up and talking to, to yourself and mum about swimming in your day versus swimming in our day obviously there are huge differences and jazz has just touched on this psychological support physio all the extra you know support staff and services that we can have access to now you didn't have and that that obviously changes it massively but the funny thing is the fundamentals and the little the little things that we connect over and still laugh at today, like you come in from a really hard session in the morning and your parents are there and they go, oh, you, you've said to me, granddad, you say to you, come on, gay, put the kettle on. And you said, you're so tired from a training session. That you just thought, leave me alone. You know, I don't want, why have you waited till now to ask me to put the kettle on? Just those little funny moments of support from home and, and funny times where, you know, the emotion from training or races come into it and it's all the same stuff. You know, I'll, I'll have gone through, Jazz will have gone through all the same, the, the same emotional journey, the ups, the downs as you did, but we just have, well, obviously it's a lot more advanced now or we had that. So, I wanted to ask, Gainer, from when you were swimming, when you were younger, if you put that Gainer into now, how do you think Gainer would have coped in that and having the support? Well, I think I'd have loved psychological support because, you know, you touched on it before, going from a junior athlete into senior swimming is quite, is quite tough, particularly if you've shone at, um, at junior swimming because you're you're up there and then everybody starts to go past you or you know and then you, it sort of levels out and you and you find out who's in it for the long haul but that's that's quite tough to contend with I think yeah I think that that would be the biggest difference for me and maybe having a sip of something <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a drink at the end of the lane <laughs> <laughs> What yeah. about the social media side, though, Guy? Because obviously that's massive now. And like you said, times, results, rankings, records, it's all up there with an instant. You know, yeah. there's a competition and you know who's done what time straight away. How do you think that, would you have enjoyed that? Or would you? are you quite glad that you, you went through your swimming when there wasn't really that to, to, you know, deal with? I think I'm probably better swimming when I swam. You know where you, you yes you got to the nationals and you, you you would hear of good 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 swims that had happened but they weren't in your face they weren't you know 
like they would be now. And yeah, I suppose I would find that quite hard to deal with because I don't know about you two, but I always found nationals was the worst, you know, going and racing against your peers at nationals was more nerve wracking than Commonwealth, Europeans, Worlds, Olympics. It, because you're lining up and you, you're thinking, God, I, I, people are expecting me to win this and uh, she's looking good. And, you know, it's a real, it, it's a real mindset, isn't it? Whereas when you went to a bigger event, yes, there were great names there, but you'd think, oh, I'll have a go again against these, you know, I'll just, I'll just have a good go at this. I talk about that now because even when we talk about I found like a lot of the times the trials where now it's like you have to get a certain time and being able to chase the time whereas at the international competitions you can actually just enjoy the race and no one really remembers what time you've gone at those big competitions it's about being there so I guess that that I do I can completely relate to what you're saying about that how I guess racing against the best in Britain and that that kind of pressure a bit um, compared to on the world stage it is a lot different. Um, but how did you manage, I guess, what age were you actually at the Olympics? Sorry. 18. 18. So how did you manage like all your schoolwork um, and all that kind of stuff with training? Like what were those challenges that came across? Because 18 is a fairly young age to be going to the Olympics. And I guess with all the stresses of school and all the other things that are going on at that age too. Well, sadly for me, I uh, I just concentrated on my swimming at the time, and I that was that is actually one of my big regrets that I didn't um, study further. I think if I had my time again, I probably I probably would have liked to have tried um, an American university. I think um, to do it to do it that way, but at the time I made the decision to stay at home and. Wigan Wasp was pretty much, I mean, we obviously we were amateurs, but all of us, the top, the top squad, we didn't work. You know, we, we just swam. That was our jobs. We, you know, in our heads, that was our jobs. You know, we used to sign on on a, every other Monday. And that funded our swimming. And so if we talk about now, so we've talked a bit about your junior time in swimming and, I know 18 isn't old, but let's talk about the build up to the Olympics and, and that four year cycle of um, when you decided to move, move away at a young age, like Jazz decided to move to Swansea. Um, how was that move? And was it nerve wracking? Were you excited to go into a squad that had some great swimmers and you were obviously going to be a part of that? How did you feel that process went for you? Well, to be honest, because I knew all the swimmers that I was going to join and they'd always actively been friendly and welcomed me, I didn't have any qualms whatsoever. I knew that they were tough. You know, I mean, when I say tough, really tough. I mean, it was, it was such a wake-up call for myself and the horse fields who went with me because we, we'd, we'd done okay um, at City of Manchester, we'd done okay. You know, we were swimming quite fast um, with with the training that we that we were on, and then we rocked up at Wigan Wasps, and this was a whole new ball game. You don't stop. You don't go to the toilet. You don't miss a session ever. You never late. You know, for a training session, you never get out. You're never ill. You're never injured. I mean, the list went on and there was this very healthy uh, rivalry amongst, well, particularly the girls, you, you know, we, we all, and we all did the same work, more or less. You know, Keith has had us on the same programme, which is quite bizarre these days, but he, he managed it. And me as an I am I did... I had to rotate my number one stroke. So I did fly, back, breast, free, breast, because obviously I was better at breaststroke and I did still compete 
200 breaststroke. So I had two days at, at breaststroke and, and a day each at the other strokes. Um, you know, and yet we had Anne Oscar be doing, uh, Anne and Janet Oscar be doing 200 fly. We had June doing anything from 50 free right up to 800 free. We had Steve Poulter in there, 400 IM, Nick Hodgson, 200. Andrea on 100 back, 200 back. Ada on 100 flat. It, it was incredible, really. But when there was a set, well, any set, there would be this sort of, you, you try and work your way up, up the lane. You never led it because there was uh, Nick Hodgson and, and Mark... Um, Mark, uh, Steve Poulter at the front of the leading, but then it came the women. So we'd all want to be going sort of third. You know, it, it was an incredible, it was an incredible, I'd, I'd love to relive one of my days there. Um, yeah, I'd love to relive, you know, a day there again to just take it in because unbeknown to me, how other people saw us as a team was, you know, quite amazing. It is special, I guess, being able to try and think about going back. And even some of my races, I don't remember that well. No. I don't know if you feel the same. Um, but if I guess having the kind of knowledge or um, information that's out there now, if you could go back to those training days, are there things that you would have liked to have added to the program? Would you have changed? Would you have tweaked? Would you have focused a bit more on certain areas? What would be the things that you would, I guess, add or change to the program back then? I think really me, I'd just work more on the mental side. I think that's my biggest thing. You know, I think the amount of work I did, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed training hard. You know, as Lauren said, I used to come in after a training session. Well, this was when I'd moved to Stockport Metro now, because obviously when I was at Wigan, I didn't see my mum and dad. But when I moved back home and went to Stockport Metro, you know, I'd, I'd come in after morning training. My dad would say, are you brewing up, Gay? You know, <laughs> yeah. All right, dad, yeah. But you, you're so in your zone as a swimmer, aren't you? That you only want to talk when you want to talk. You, after your session, you don't want anyone talking to you about it. You know, if it's gone great, fine, but you, you're still going over it, aren't you? And you, you want that time to just sort of decompress and then think about your session tonight, not, not be talking about how you are to anyone so you said like the mental side like going into that a bit deeper what do you think more of the support is it um around training like offloading was it i guess around the competition the nerve side of it or just i guess general well-being and being able to look after yourself and who you are as a person away from the swimmer um i guess having your own identity away from the swimmer what i guess in the mental side of it do you think are the the main areas that maybe you would have liked to have worked on a bit more i think yeah the, come on come on gay open up here tell us what did you go through love come on i think really the confidence side that that's the that's the main thing for racing the the your application to racing when you're younger, when I was younger, I mean, I made my, I, I swam my first international at 11, still at primary school. And then two years later, I made the senior international team. And they used to have um, a big meet at Coca-Cola meet at Crystal Palace. And I, I made that and, you know, there was some fabulous swimmers and me and, uh, but I, I took all that in, in my stride, really, at that, at that age. It's only later on that I, you know, when you realise what it is to win and what it is to lose and the fear of losing. And I know you talk about it a lot because it's so evident, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, we all suffer from the fear of failure rather than just being able to get on and 
give it your all, enjoy it. I, you know, I think I put too many, I think, yeah, I spoke to myself too much, put too many pressures on. I don't know. I don't know. But Gay, the thing is, what you're talking about now is what everybody goes through. Everyone in swimming goes through that. We all talk to ourselves too much. I mean, our head's in the water and we're on our own for the majority of swimming, training, racing. We're, you know, it's on our own. And although it is very much a team thing, and, and Jazz and I have said that before, these are all emotions and things that lots of people listening and anyone that goes through sport can relate to. And so when you say the confidence and the fear of failure, it's just so common yet. So more talked about now. Yes, but still not that much. And so what you're saying, people can relate and it's something that people do struggle with and need to work on for sure. I mean, I, I as, as an I am swimmer now, I used to, be okay out on the fly, I'd be up there, thereabouts, backstroke, I mean, give me a break. I'd turn virtually last and then I'd come up and see who I'd got to chase down on the breaststroke. And my front crawl was okay, obviously I could hold my own there, but I used to feel sorry for myself, you know, <laughs> in the race, you know, I'd be turning back to breast and thinking, what am I doing? You know, big underwater pull and kick, nearly dying because you're in oxygen debt, coming up, <gasps> trying to look, you know, and then thinking, oh my gosh, now apply yourself and try and... And I did try and improve my backstroke, but it just never worked. Just never worked. So, Gay, you then obviously did a fantastic job and continue to race well train hard as you've said and make the olympics but let's just talk about the olympic trials because we all all sat here have very different but similar experiences from olympic trials how was the the olympic trials for you in 84 uh well nerve-wracking obviously and i didn't ever mind my sisters coming to watch you know, they, they were my biggest supporters, really, Karen and Yvonne. And because they'd swam, they understood it all. But what they did was they uh, smuggled my mum and dad in. I didn't know. Thank God I didn't see them before I raced. Um, but, yeah, mum and dad were there to watch it as well. But in those days, you, there was, um, yeah, you know, you could have two false starts, and we had two. So we went on the third one, which was... Actually, it calmed my nerves a bit, a false start. And you don't have that luxury anymore. But no, that, it, was, it was fine. And obviously the elation of qualifying was fabulous. Contrast to 88, when I just swam the worst race of my life in the 400 I am at the 88. I'd, quali I'd done the qualifying time at late April, and you had to have your qualifying time in after May the 1st, and I never repeated it. What were the qualifying times like back then? Were they really quick, or was there the set of standards, kind of like the FINA rate? Did they have had the an, you, you had an A and a B qualifying time, which, which were quite... Well, they were obviously tough for that time, but they were nothing like... I mean, swimming's come on so much, it's unbelievable. When I look at the times that, that you guys have to do to qualify, I mean, just, it blows me away. But obviously so much has changed. The technology moves on with the suits and the caps, the goggles. It seems like every kind of millisecond, the tiniest margins can obviously be won or lost. So everyone's always looking for that smallest advantage. So we, we spoke about it before, like when do the times start to stop or slow down or... Yeah. But it seems like world records obviously still being broken and things. But I guess from your like Olympic experience, how was that whole thing for you going to the Olympics at, at a fairly young age? Was there many of you on the team in 84? Yeah, there seemed, there seemed to be loads. I think there was 30, I want to say about 32. And um, we had, I think about another four, four swimmers that joined us sort of late that, that were really next 
and they all swam out of the skin. So they more than justified the selection. I can't remember what happened there, but yeah, there was there was four sort of added to the team. But I mean, our preparation was great. We had a training camp at San Diego for two weeks. Before that, we had a competition in Sweden, uh, training camp at Crystal Palace. I mean, all very tame for what you guys have, you know, your training camps, you've been all over the world. But I mean, we were, you know, dead pleased with our, our training camps. It was fabulous. And so before we actually touch on the actual race at the Olympics and stuff like that, initiations, were they, did you do them? What, what were they like? What did you have to go through, Gay, to be initiated into Team GB? Well, funny enough, I, I never did have, I never had an initiation. And people did after me, um, but I never, I didn't at 13, I, I, didn't, I didn't have to do one. Um, but at the Olympics, I don't know if you, you two did this, after a training camp, we'd always sort of finish with a t- talent show. Could you call it a t- talent show, something like that? And um, myself and four of the other girls on, uh, on the team decided that we'd do uh, a strip down to our bikinis that we'd been given for the, by Speedo for the Olympics. With, when we had a, our Olympic robes on, and uh, was, it, it was to um, Frankie goes to Holly, Frankie goes to Hollywood, relax, and um, I can remember being outside, and I was, you know, nerves were just oh my gosh. I mean, I feel nervous now just talking about it. And I looked to the other four girls and somebody did a nervous, you know, a nervous laugh. Ah, you know, like that, where it, you're terrified, but it's sort of a laugh. And I weed. I'm going to, uh, I'm laughing my head off here because I love this story. <laughs> and I can relate because I talked about weeing at the Jewel in the Pool event um, with Jazz on the podcast a few episodes ago. And it must run in the family when we get excited or nervous. <laughs> but um, so you weed, nice. It's nice to know, actually, that even though all these changes have happened within sport and within swimming, <laughs> the basics are still the same. The talent shows, the initiations, yeah. you know, the embarrassing times and everyone just having a laugh. It's, it's really nice to hear those stories, of course. How did you deal with nerves? What, what would you do? What was your coping mechanisms for that? I don't think I actually had one. I think just, I think we all try to project the fact that we weren't nervous, you know, to be sort of lying out on poolside, just a stream of bodies lying, people lying down, uh, shaking the legs, you know, chatting, Walkman on. And, and in those days it was Walkman, it wasn't iPod or something like that. It was, you know, um, but, well, I suppose you just hope that you didn't look as nervous as you felt and just try to use the nerves to your advantage. Yeah, and that's the thing. We talk about it all the time is nerves and it's actually okay to be nervous, but I think having those kind of things, the go-tos is always like, an, it makes it feel a bit easier. Um, but we all do get nervous and I think um, it's a very normal thing. But I guess going back to like the Olympic experience going to the Olympics you had a very successful Olympics um I'm guessing you were happy with your performances at the Olympics and can you just talk us through I guess coming back from the Olympics and was there the same excitement I presume there was um that we still have for the Olympics and the GB team coming home and um everyone I guess talking about the Olympics did you go through any like Olympic blues coming back and that that a lot of athletes talk about the come down of being in that, that bubble and excitement to come back to, to normal life? Gosh, I think I had an, I think I had a blue every time I came back from any trip because for me, I felt that those, the, the people that you were with, those elite athletes that you were with, you, they just, you, you, you get each other, you, you understand each other. There isn't anyone asking you to brew up because <laughs> you're all miserable. 
you know, you're all just done a session and you've all worked hard and you've all got the same mental anguish and you're all doing the initiations and there's just such great camaraderie on a, on a, on a, on a GB team or an England team. So I always felt those blues. Um, there wasn't the same sort of hype as there is now because obviously media's changed again and with lottery funding came more success across all the dis disciplines. So, you know, we didn't have a fraction of the success that you guys have enjoyed in your careers because we didn't have the extra, we didn't have the nutritionist, the psychologist, the, the massage therapists. So success was for the few, really. I know, Gaith, that you loved your trips abroad. I've heard many stories. And thanks to you, all the coaches that obviously swam in your era or knew you or were on teams with you or whatever, whenever I'd go to British Champs or any competition, really, there'd be one coach at least who, how's gay? Da -da -da. Oh, this one time this happened, which I won't talk about in the podcast because some of them are... You know, we need to keep it PG. But um, I know you had a great time and it, and it's, it's always brilliant to hear that. And it's nice to hear that you made the most of being with the, those teammates. And I know you might look back and think, did I make the most of, of that time? But I'm sure, well, from what I've heard, you did. I mean, Jazz's old coach, Dave McNulty, he always talks about you and having a great time and how is she and all that sort of stuff. So it's brilliant to hear. I want to just go to the to the race now, the 400 medley final at the Olympics. Jazz touched on, she doesn't really remember much of her races. So I wanted to ask if you do. And if not, you can watch it on YouTube. I have watched it multiple times. And you actually did do a, a full start at the Olympics. And I don't even think, well, you do remember that. And it, it's just really nice to see. I'm going to link it in the description. So people, if you want to watch Gainers for a medley final, you should. And it's great to see. But just talk me through what you do remember. And because, because I mean, it's, it's an amazing feat that lots of people would love to be able to say they did. Yeah, I think... For, for us, we were over the other side of Los Angeles in um, in the nice part of actually Los Angeles. So we used to have to get up about half past four to simulate an afternoon swim, even though you were swimming in the morning. So um, the warm up felt okay, felt good, went into the race. It was touch and go whether I'd make the final, but I did. Um, there was no time to go back and th those days you didn't have um, semi-finals so it was heats in the morning finals in the evening and we just sort of crashed down at um, the speedo reps hotel and there was about four I don't know whether there was four or six of us in this one room this hotel room and that was our rest which you know is bonkers really it's you know not good enough but yeah, nerves as usual. You sat in your tent because it was um, it was at UCLA. Uh, we were at UCLA, and the swimming was at USC, University of Southern California, and it was all a temporary thing. You know, the bleachers were there, so and there was um, it was there was a stand up fifty meter pool to warm up in, uh, but everything was sort of tense everywhere. Uh, so, you know, sat in our tents and it was outdoors, of course, then. Um, I know you can't, they don't do worlds or anything outdoor now anymore, do they? But, you know, our, ours was outdoors, which was another thing that I absolutely loved. Um, and yeah, so the call room was um, a nervy place to be. And how, like, I guess the race um, and coming through that week, um, was it? Did you say you were at a hotel? You were, didn't have the athletes' village that they have now. You were in hotels. There was two athlete. There was two athletes' villages. So some of the teams were at USC, and some of the teams were at UCLA, and the British were over at UCLA. So we had a nicer, a nicer village, a nicer athlete village. It was posher, if you like. But the swim, the swimming took place at the other athlete village. 
So we used to have to come across town to actually do our racing. And if you could go back, I guess, and tell your 18 year old self, then standing on those blocks, what would you tell her now? I guess that maybe she wouldn't have thought, well, you wouldn't have thought back then. Sorry, I'm coming in with the hard questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't, oh gosh. I mean, just get your bloody finger out. You know, you've done the work. I, you know, I, I did a PB. I, I swam the I swam the best time of my life, but I like probably ninety nine point nine percent of the population feel that I never achieved what I should have achieved in swimming or in my sport. So yes, I made the final, and yes, I did a PB, but it just wasn't good enough. And I I, I don't know what I could have done to have bettered that I mean, yeah you're not you're not alone in that feeling so many people finish sport majority i would say finish sport and think have i reached my potential have i been able to you know reach the the highest level that i could have done the fastest that i could have yeah. and it's a question that lots of people have to become comfortable with and just to say at that time that's the best that i could do so you know, it's great to look in hindsight and it's a lovely thing, but actually at that time, you know, that's the best that you could have done. And I, I, I've heard from my coach that I had in Lanzarote, Robin Brew, he said himself, he was at that, that Olympics as well. Mm -hmm. And he said they had to make the decision, he'd made the final, whether to go back all that way to rest in the room or to to stay at the pool and just try and do the best that he could and recover there. And actually he did stay and it probably wasn't the right decision for him. So we all have regrets, you know, and we all could we have done things better? Yes. But actually at the time you just make those decisions to, to try and do the best that you can do and, and you can't knock that. And yeah. one of the things when I talk to you, Gay, because I get the pleasure of all the time is it upsets me when you don't have still, you don't look back on your career necessarily and go, I'm proud of that. I don't think I've ever heard you say that before. And that obviously is upsetting because I'm incredibly proud of it. And <laughs> don't get upset. But I am, I'm very, you know, people ask, Jazz can vouch for me, any of my friends can vouch for me when I, I'm asked, who's your inspiration? What are you proud of? most proud of the gainer gainer's whole career and when i go on poolside it's the most amazing feeling to have people ask about you and and just be proud of what you've done and, and it, we just wish that you could feel that way as well so i'm going to read something out to you now that i know you've seen but i had uh, there was a woman that, that reached out and watched something else that we'd done together and she said one of the parts of her email was Gaynor had such a reputation for being tough and strong and outstanding at so many events and at such a young age. I never thought of her as a rival as she was totally out of my league, an absolute sensation. I think she was on the senior national squad when other elite swimmers of her age were only on the youth squad. When she appeared at galas, we just had to get up and give it our best, knowing she was like an invincible war horse. And, I, and listening to that, I've heard so many people say things like that. And so when you hear things like that, Gay, how does it make you feel? Well, I suppose like it's talking about someone else. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's, it's humbling, I suppose. I, you know, I, I was a good child swimmer, but I just, I, it, didn't, it didn't carry on for me. Not not how it, you know, how it should have done. I can see you getting emotional and I don't want you to because it did carry on. You went to the Olympics, Gay. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And this is where it is upsetting and for a lot of people that do really well, but it doesn't matter. Getting to nationals is amazing. You know, there's so many swimmers that would love to even get to nationals, regionals, oh. all these things are incredible achievements and so 
I would love for you to just go, do you know what? I was really good at swimming, actually. And I had a great career. I went to the Olympics. I wore the GB flag. And, you know, it's just something that I'm passionate about, you being confident in yourself. You talk about, I wish I was more confident when I was younger. Yeah. But right now, what can you do that's that improves that? It's being confident now. Yeah, I yeah. see Jazz is unmuted, so I'm going to let Jazz speak. <laughs> and even... To the point, I always said, like, I wanted to people to see, I guess, my swimming and think, oh, she worked so hard. She did everything. And just hearing what someone else has said about you, that is the biggest compliment to say how hard you worked, how tough you were. I think mm -hmm. that is just someone just appreciating, like, how hard you worked. And that shouldn't be overlooked just because you maybe didn't necessarily achieved what you dreamt of. And we talk about it all the time and it's kind of like I'm banging on about it, but I guess, again, the person you are and how how you've clearly made such an impact on so many people's lives. And even with Lauren talking about you and how you've inspired her. And I'm sure there has been plenty of people that you've inspired. And even though I guess deep down, sometimes we don't always achieve those dreams and some things I've not necessarily achieved that I wanted to. But I guess it's being able to look back and the impact that you've been able to have on so many people is so special. And that's not something that we should take lightly because it's 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 an incredible thing to be able to inspire, motivate and to be seen as such an incredible athlete, too. Thanks very much, Jazz. So I'm going to I'm going to go, go back to this woman who sent me this email because she asked me to ask a few questions. And I've shared that with Jazz and Jazz has done a great job in asking them <laughs> what swimming does Gaina do today? Did she ever do masters? And would she consider a comeback? No, I, I've i always swam, I suppose, um, throughout the, the rest of my life, the, you know, the remainder of my life, I suppose. I didn't swim for a couple of years, um, anything, you know, sort of serious. Um, then I, I did row for a couple of years, which I absolutely loved. And then I had my two children and my husband and I moved out to Spain, um, which afforded me the luxury of being able to swim sort of daily there. So yes, I've always swam. Um, and when I moved to my, the house I'm at now, I joined a master's club, which is Northgate. Um, and I've, I've enjoyed doing that. I've enjoyed the social aspect, I suppose, more because I find swimming incredibly frustrating because I'm not the swimmer I was, <laughs> you know, not on any level, you know, the, the feel of the water, sluggish, you know, you're panting, you're, oh, it's just it's so unforgiving, it's horrible. But I enjoyed that, but just wouldn't want to do master's swimming. No way, no how. I've done, I've done the odd, <laughs> would you? I mean, I've done the odd um, travesia. When, when we lived in Spain, there's, there's one race, a sea swim, that goes from one end of Sitges to the other. It's about two and a half kilometres in it, Lauren, something like that, two miles, something like that. That was something that I used to enjoy. Well, no, I didn't enjoy it at all, no. I used to get to one point and you'd get all the diesel fumes from the boats and I'd see your, your dad's re favourite restaurant, the Kansas, and I'd look over as I was swimming thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I couldn't wait to get out the other end. But So I've always swam and I've enjoyed my masters, but I've just actually resigned from that club because the coach resigned and it was his sessions that uh, I enjoyed because they, they were very like Keith Bewley's, but, but tailor-made for a one-hour master. So for me, lots of I am. It was great. I loved it. Whereas I don't want to be... A lot of the master swimmers are quite sort of obsessed with it. And I'm certainly not obsessed with it. And if looking back, I guess, what do you think you learn either about yourself or about life through swimming that you've actually been able to use in like other areas of your life, obviously um, with the family and all the kind of other things work-wise. What have you learned, I guess, from your swimming days that have really helped you with 
everyday life, I guess? Well, I don't think it's sort of, uh, it, you obviously have learned it, but it's not a, it's not a um, conscious learn. And I think that your strength comes out. People tell me I'm strong. I, I lost my husband uh, and had to carry on because uh, I had two boys. And that's when you have to pull on your resources. And I think, yes, I probably am quite tough. You know, my mum's tough. My sisters are tough. Lawrence, we, we, are a, we are a strong sort of family. And I think a lot of that comes from, well, your upbringing, but the fact that we've swam and we've adapted to different situations, you know, we, you've had to be determined, you've had to be dedicated, you've had to be uh, proficient, you've had to work hard. You know, we're a normal working class family. And to get everything that we've had, we've had to work hard for. And I think that transfers into everything you do in life, which you, you can't put a price on that. And the other thing that comes from it is, and Lauren will know this, friendships. The friendships from swimming are just amazing because... I could see people that I've not seen for 30 years, like I, I have done, you know, with the... With, the, with Facebook um, being around, all the people that have gone back onto, you know, swimmers, and I've met some of them, I'm not seeing them for 30 years. And it's just like you were on a trip yesterday. It's, in, it's an incredible feeling, the friendships. And I was always very good at keeping in touch anyway with people. I always wrote to loads of swimmers. In those days, it was letter writing, obviously. Um, and yeah, those connections really mean a lot to me. Priceless. Yeah, and, and Jazz and I always touch on how much swimming can do and sport in general for people in mental, physical, you know, there's so many benefits from it. And you obviously just touched on Simon. So swimming brought you Simon. I know you weren't swimming at the time, but you were working for Speedo and you saw him at a conference. And rumour has it, he said, as when he met you, or I don't know if he'd even met you yet, but he saw you across the room and said, I'm going to marry that woman. And obviously did end up marrying you. And you've got two amazing boys, Stan and Spen, my cousins. Shout out to Stan and Spen. They're like the best people ever. But as you said, you lost Simon. I did speak about that on two episodes ago. Really emotional for all of us, but obviously for you, it was awful the worst thing and you have dealt with that and you have you have two absolutely phenomenal boys and you know that that must give you confidence as well and it goes back to that that thing of you should be proud of yourself you know you really should you've done a great job and so and swimming has been a massive part of how you've probably dealt with that you know, yeah. what you've learned through your swimming days, like you've just said. And so it's not just, oh, swimming. It, it just teaches you so many things. And so anyone that's going through that journey and listening now or has been through it, just look back or look forward to what you can get out of the amazing sport of swimming, um, which, you know, we're obviously all incredibly grateful for. Yeah, you know, on that, when you dive in to a pool, and there's just you and the noise, or the, no noise, but you know the noise, don't you, when you first dive in. I mean, it's such a healing, therapeutic, it's just a luxurious moment, isn't it, when you just first dive in, and then you start swimming, and it's you back to where, you, where you're most happiest, I suppose, really, in, in many ways. I mean, I know I've just said, gosh, you know, I don't enjoy feeling, <laughs> you know, achy and everything but it's it it is it's a it's a place to do your thinking it's a place to uh iron out all your stress you know it, it's it's an amazing sport an amazing sport well even listening to you and your story it's just been so inspiring and i think so many people will be able to relate to the things that have even been happening in your swimming journey even going back 
quite a few years that the, the same things happening now with confidence and nerves and um, all those kinds of other things. I guess there's still things that people deal with now. And I think just listening, I, I've been so amazed by your story and how humble and you play your, you play your achievements and your story down so much. Whereas really um, listening to you and all the things that you were able to achieve and at such a young age, to come through and it's just been amazing to to listen to and to to hear it really because I've never really gone through all your journey and heard about it all I know Lauren has so um thank you so much for sharing so much for with us I've absolutely loved it and I know our listeners will get so much from all the things you're saying and um It'd be great for you, I guess, to look back and be able to actually be proud and happy and um, love the journey that you have. Because when we, when I look back and I think, oh, wow, like she went to the Olympics and the events that you swam making the Olympic final, I'm in awe of you and all the things that you've achieved, um, not just in swimming, but in life and everything that you've um, been able to overcome and go through. It's just in so inspiring. So thank you for sharing. I know Lauren will want to, give you a little message before we head off but I just wanted to say thank you because I've absolutely loved it thank you Jas yeah no I think Jas just summed it up perfectly and even though I'm your niece um I think Jas said it better than I could have so yeah I just hope that you know reflecting on this episode and looking back Gay, you 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 were great. You were fantastic in the things that you've done. And, you know, you should you should be proud of yourself because we all are. But thank you for listening to the listeners. It's obviously been a really special one for me to have one of my best friends and to have her chat about her career and all that sort of stuff. And hopefully you've connected in a way that, that Jazz and I have um, and relate to some of the, the stories that, that Gain has been talking about. So don't forget to listen to us every Wednesday. We release a new episode. We are also now on Amazon Music, which is cool. We aren't musicians, but we are on Amazon Music. So there you go. But yeah, no, it's uh, we hope you're enjoying season two. And yeah, we hope you enjoyed the podcast. Mm-hmm.